It is often tempting to open an apocalypse and just begin taking it at face value. Uh, much of the popular interpretation of books like Daniel and Revelation basically assume that uh, the apocalyptic sections of those works uh, are simply an extension of prophecy and so should be read merely as prophecy, another kind of prophecy, one that is more uh, interested in, in foretelling specific events than, say, an Isaiah or a Jeremiah were, but nonetheless um, uh, still acting in a manner that is consistent with and merely an extension of uh, Hebrew prophecy and particularly predictive prophecy. However, as um, both scholars and theologians, uh, church leaders, uh, read more and more widely outside of the biblical canon, exposing themselves to, um, to extra canonical books that more resembled Daniel and Revelation, uh, they became aware of the existence of apocalypse as a genre uh, distinct from other known genres of biblical literature. I say churchmen and what have you because in the, in the, in the 19th century, actually archbishops and, and other pastors were really leading figures in uh, publishing, promoting, studying extra-biblical uh, literature. It wasn't just the province of people in universities. In the 20th, late 20th century, uh, that bifurcation of vocation became far more uh, pronounced. So uh, during that period, we can say, in fact, scholars uh, began looking at this larger body of texts uh, and uh, began to recognize that these texts had more in common with each other than with, other, than with any other texts uh, that they knew either inside or beyond the canon, thus suggesting the existence of a genre that could be clearly differentiated from classical prophecy on the one hand or wisdom literature on the other, um, a genre that was fed by both but had developed into something different, perhaps with rules and practices and conventions of its own that needed to be understood um, uh, on its own terms rather than on the terms of another genre such as uh, the genre of Hebrew prophecy. Hartman and Delella, uh, Lewis Hartman and Alexander Delella, uh, in the uh, introduction to their commentary on Daniel, give about 10 pages uh, to sorting out apocalypse as a genre, uh, as well as other uh, senses in which the word apocalyptic and apocalypticism have come to be used. And they noticed that there are, in fact, a number of literary conventions you know, common features that can be found in many of these texts, uh, suggesting that they are generic genre-related conventions of apocalypses. Um, they noted among these, first, the devices of anonymous authorship or pseudonymous authorship. Pseudonymous authorship, uh, obviously, um, uh, being um, uh, an author otherwise unknown to us, writing in the name of another figure. Uh, in this literature, very often, in fact, I think always, a figure known from the Hebrew scriptures, thus uh, a figure with some antiquity, some authority, some kind of persona, uh, often that makes that figure appropriate for the kind of message that the real author is presenting in this apocalypse. They noted also, secondly, uh, that uh, the relating of dreams and visions, uh, to which we could add conversations with uh, supernatural figures about the meanings of dreams and visions, uh, were a primary way of conveying the message that the author wanted to convey. Alongside this third, uh, very frequently, uh, a sort of panorama of history, covering the time between the, um, the claimed author 
whether that was an Enoch or an Ezra or a Baruch or a Daniel, and the time of the author and his hearers, the time that was of greatest concern um, to uh, those actually composing the Apocalypse. Um, in Hartman and Delella, we encounter this as Vaticinia ex eventu, that's merely Latin for prophecies after the fact, um, a historical review in the form of prediction, though written uh, much later, uh, in fact, after um, those events had happened. And fourth, the feature of symbolic language. Uh, instead of talking overtly about kings, rival groups, kingdoms, uh, and the like, um, the author would talk about um, animals, monstrous beasts uh, with, with strange characteristics um, that recalled, uh, potentially then, features of a succession of kingdoms. Uh, or they talk about alternating periods of, of, um, of light and dark clouds or, or light and darkness symbolizing uh, whether or not an age was characterized mostly by fidelity to God or infidelity to God's covenant. Um, or uh, they would uh, provide a, a, an allegory of history from creation all the way down to the time of the real author um, using regular animals uh, for, uh, as symbols for uh, different figures throughout history, different types of groups throughout history. And finally, esoteric content, that is to say, insider information. Um, that is, uh, someone who was a part of the community that uh, produced the apocalypse uh, in question would, would understand it. Or um, even if a wider group would understand it, it would be um, it would be written mysteriously as if communicating hidden, secret, special information, sometimes um, uh, requiring some significant mental uh, effort. For example, when John, in the uh, most famous Christian apocalypse in Revelation, uh, starts talking about the need to figure out the name of the beast from the N n from the number, from the sum of the letters uh, of that beast's name. Now, the other things that uh, Hartman and DeLella say uh, in their summary definition uh, are less helpful insofar as they are so specific to their understanding of Daniel. They don't really belong in a definition of apocalyptic, per se. Um, Nevertheless, we could say, for example, that apocalypses on the whole do seem um, uh, more to be written from a posture of non-violent resistance, uh, whether that is ideological, uh, you know, we have no role in, um, in helping God advance God's plan by our military action, or whether it's simply practical. We don't stand a snowball's chance in, 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 in the Judean desert of defeating the oppressors ourselves. We must wait for God's intervention. Um, I'm not entirely uh, convinced that uh, uh, many of these apocalyptists were pacifists uh, in terms of their convictions, so much in terms of their practical and, and honest assessment of their own strength, even the strength of Judea as a nation, um, to throw off the yoke of the Gentiles effectively. The third point um, in Hartman and DeLella's um, definition here uh, is certainly true of, of most apocalypses. That is to say, the uh, author of the Apocalypse often looks beyond death or beyond the end of normal history uh, for God's promises to come to pass for God's faithful people. Um, there is almost a giving up 
on this age in many apocalypses, uh, such that it is the age to come that is after God's decisive intervention or even after death um, on the other side of resurrection, that we will experience justice, the wholeness that God has for us, that we will see the, the covenant and its promises uh, realized. Now, um, between Hartman and Delella's work and what we could read in John Collins' uh, work, either, uh, for example, in his book, The Apocalyptic Imagination, which is uh, still, I think, now 30-some years after its composition, an excellent introduction to the genre and to specific examples of the genre, um, there, there's been a lot of scholarly work on apocalyptic literature, per se. John Collins was, in fact, at the center of a working group in the Society of Biblical Literature that specifically sought to, uh, to study apocalypses and try to understand the generic conventions, expectations, features of that genre uh, with a view to learning how best to read apocalypses and how best to understand their, um, their mode of acting upon their hearers um, and uh, of discerning to what end they would so act upon their hearers. Um, at the end of their work comparing um, extant Jewish and Christian apocalypses, but also looking beyond uh, to some uh, examples of, of apocalypse-like literature in the Greco-Roman world or the, um, the eastern, um, east of the Roman Empire, uh, they devised this uh, definition of the genre. Um, apocalypses represent a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is meted, mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality, which is both temporal, insofar as it envisages eschatological salvation, and spatial, insofar as it envisages another supernatural world. This definition, it seems to me, highlights very helpfully several features of apocalypses that are essential to their rhetorical strategy and effect. First, apocalypses, on the whole, seem to open up views beyond normal lived experience, setting the audience's space, the, the, the real spaces that they occupy day to day, within the conceptual context of a larger, invisible world. Um, very few apocalypses do all of this, but we can find in uh, some of them, um, well, we can find in almost all of them, some attention to spaces beyond uh, regular, ordinary, everyday lived space, uh, the places where you or I might go. Apocalypses often look up into the heavenly spaces toward God's throne, uh, showing what is happening there, um, how, um, how cosmic activity around God's throne is affecting or will yet affect um, events in ordinary lived space. Or they look down to infernal spaces, uh, the places where demons and their partisans dwell and plot and initiate actions against God or against the faithful. And they um, often look uh, neither to heaven or the abyss, as it were, but to earthly created spaces where uh, people just don't go. So, for example, in First Enoch, um, Enoch, and here are the quotation marks around the name Enoch, um, in effect, tours all kinds of earthly regions uh, that just are off the map, but are nevertheless important conceptually because they are regions for the punishment of the wicked, uh, or, or regions where the final judgment will take place, or regions where God will come to reign on earth and gather uh, the, the chosen faithful ones uh, to enjoy a, an Eden-like existence together on earth. 
And so uh, at the end of reading the apoco uh, such an apocalypse, uh, the hearers um, have reinforced for themselves a much larger map of the world, of the universe, than they might have had going into the hearing of that apocalypse, perhaps um, uh, too much concerned with what was going on in merely the lived spaces of their everyday world and its pressures upon them, and, uh, and therefore what might seem advantageous to do in those lived spaces. If we lose sight of the bigger picture of the cosmos uh, and, and everything that's happening, uh, or everything that's simply waiting out there in the cosmos, um, so the, uh, the underlying argument of Apocalypse goes, uh, we will make bad decisions in the present because we will have looked away from the big picture and allowed uh, certain distractions in the little picture, the, the local picture, to loom too large on our minds and hearts and wills, um, derailing us from living in line with, with the larger picture that includes God and God's activities and God's uh, realm. And then apocalypses uh, often uh, almost always, in fact, have a temporal framework as well as a spatial framework. And here again, it's a matter of looking more broadly so that uh, we look away from the present moment and its um, challenges, its demands, its rigors, um, and we look uh, toward the cosmic backstory uh, that brought us to this present situation, and that might help explain how we find ourselves in this present situation. So we reach back often in apocalypses to the distant past. Um, a book like First Enoch will do this most, um, um, most engagingly, really, uh, developing the story of the, of the watchers who mated with human females and created the giants looking to that story as the, in effect, the origin of, of all human ills, uh, the effects of which are still wreaking havoc uh, in the lived time and lived space of the audience of First Enoch. John, in Revelation, uh, looks back to uh, the story of the, the old serpent's war in heaven uh, and his expulsion thence his attempt to gobble up the man-child born to the woman um, who stands upon the sun and is uh, sorry stands upon the moon and is clothed, clothed with the sun uh, as as a backstory that explains the uh, tensions uh, facing the Christian Church and that uh, John anticipates if they are actually faithful uh, will um, encompass them more and more and then apocalypses look forward as well to the end, to how God will work out the resolution um, that will show God's values, God's laws, God's uh, um, um, plan to be the ultimate foundation of the cosmos, the ultimate standards by which the cosmos will work itself out um, and the tensions of the present situation be decisively resolved. Um, as I uh, read apocalypses uh, myself in light of this definition, it seems that their major uh, function, uh, the major uh, means by which they work their effects upon their hearers is through opening up the broader canvas um, against which the moment and the challenges of our present situation need to be weighed, understood, interpreted. Um, and in light of that uh, understanding and interpreta interpretation, responded to in a manner that makes sense not just in terms of the rigors of the moment, but that makes sense in terms of the larger map of the cosmos and the larger timescape of the cosmos. Apocalypses construct and invite hearers into this larger context, this bigger picture that provides an interpretive framework for lived experience. 
by painting the cosmic backdrop of the audience's everyday realities, both in terms of time and space, apocalypses place those realities under the interpretative light of that backdrop. In most cases, the seers will also, the apocalyptic, uh, uh, the apocalypse writers, the seers, will look squarely at particular features of the audience's situation, of their own situation, in light of that uh, cosmic backdrop. That is to say, um, uh, features of the lived space and the lived experience and the lived time of the author and his hearers show up somehow in the story that the apocalypse tells, and they show up in a particular light, guiding the audience to, um, to understand their present moment in that light, and therefore to be oriented to those challenges in a, in a certain way, because they are now seen uh, in the light of that particular larger backdrop. An apocalypse, therefore, puts an everyday situation in perspective by looking at the larger context, the cosmos of faith, that should interpret that situation. From this, an apocalypse derives its power to comfort those who are discouraged or marginalized, to admonish those whose responses in their situation are not in line with their religious values, and to provide the necessary motivation to take whatever action the seer might recommend or nurture. Um, the, the genre allows the recipients to examine their behavior, whether to continue to pursue their course of action or to modify it in light of this transcendent perspective. I do believe that it's accurate to say that apocalypses are a kind of crisis literature. Um, I would be careful not to define that crisis too narrowly. Some uh, writers uh, talk about apocalypses as responses to persecution, as if that is the only kind of crisis that could occasion the writing of an apocalypse. Um, this is manifestly not true, uh, even though it continues to, to show up, for example, in, in almost every study Bible that uh, you might find. Uh, it is assumed that Revelation is written to a situation of rampant persecution throughout the churches. And part of that, um, uh, part of the, the prejudice that leads to that statement has to do with the idea that apocalypses are written merely to uh, comfort the downtrodden. And that's an old uh, prejudice. It goes back through social scientific studies of, of millenarian uh, uh, groups or even cults uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, but in fact, um, even where, where uh, the, the, the author and the recipients are living fairly comfortably, um, they can be driven to apocalyptic thinking. Uh, the crisis, uh, if, it, if one has to universalize it, is, is probably to be understood more along the lines of a crisis in worldview, a crisis of conviction. Um, so, for example, thinking about the, the Hellenistic era in Judea, um, while there was a period of rampant, terrible persecution um, that could indeed account for the creation of at least some portions of Daniel, whole other issue which we'll examine in, week, um, in weeks to come, I'm sure. Um, uh, a major element of the crisis is simply is the covenant worth keeping? Has the covenant ever really brought blessing to Israel? Or is uh, giving up on this strange, peculiar, exclusivistic way of life and getting with the program of joining the multinational uh, system uh, of, of the Hellenistic empires, is that really the sensible way to go? Is that what the world is really like and we've been uh, continually selling ourselves on this strange religion of ours, which has never produced fruit. 
And when the questions, uh, questions like that um, certainly invite the kind of response that takes the readers or the hearers to the, the features of the worldview itself. Uh, an apocalypse achieves its ends uh, in ways, you know, obviously in ways different uh, from, say, classical Hebrew prophecy or wisdom literature or just plain old homilies and preaching, um, primarily in trying to mediate an encounter with the cosmic. Uh, the person who writes the apocalypse is inviting the hearers or the readers into the experience of visualizing the throne of God and the activity there, or the activity of angels, uh, both those that are loyal to God or, or, and those who are uh, fallen and pursuing uh, an agenda contrary to God's rule, uh, and, and uh, invite them to look at spaces reserved for the punishment of those who break the covenant and places reserved for the, for the reward of those who are faithful to it all in a way uh, uh, of saying, look, our way of life and the, and the belief system, the view of the world that upholds that way of life are the genuine uh, articles. This is the way uh, the world out there beyond the visible really is. And if you could just see it, if we could just see it together, our commitment to that way of life will come out all the, all, all the much uh, more strongly and will be able to resist the erosion of our faith commitments and therefore our behavioral uh, practices um, that the challenges of, uh, of frankly, living uh, as a subordinate group under a dominant Gentile culture for 400 years, no doubt, imposed upon many Judeans uh, and would continue to impose even after the uh, short-lived success of the Hasmonean dynasty because they turned out um, in many ways to be jerks as well, just as bad as, as the Seleucid monarchs, and they were succeeded in turn by um, the, the uh, um, money-hungry, power-worshipping, um, economically exploitive uh, Romans and their lackeys in Judea, namely the Herodian family. So th there is a, a lot in that situation um, to, to call for people to rise up and say, uh, look, here is your God, and to show them a view of the throne of God. Uh, or, or look, this is what, what's out there in the world. It's not just what Hellenistic kings or or Herod's or Roman emperors are doing. It's what God has prepared for those who love him and those who scorn him. Uh, and it's, 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 uh, it's a story that is not going to play itself out according to the dictates of the Hellenistic uh, or the Hasmonean or the Herodian or the Roman rulers. It's a story that's going to play itself out according to the dictates of the one God who made covenant with us at Sinai. And to the extent that uh, these cosmic underpinnings can be restored and bolstered, to that extent, commitment to the covenant, to the Jewish way of life, uh, with Christian apocalypses, uh, commitment to, to this Jesus and to the way of life that his, his teachings and his apostles nourish, will be strengthened and bolstered. Um, the apocalypses work by inviting people in to see the wider landscape that corrects and completes the visible landscape that they have to live in day after day. Uh, and so, you know, I keep coming back to this dictum. Apocalypses don't seek so much to be interpreted, but to interpret, to interpret the present situation and the present moment of the hearers or readers in light of this larger story and in light of this larger map that the apocalypse lays out. As I think about analyzing apocalypses then, um, I find it very helpful to pause long enough to try to map out 
uh, in some cases literally just I mean I can't sketch or draw worth anything but but at least to to lay out with words on a large sheet of paper you know what is the map the mental imaginative map of the cosmos its inhabitants and their interrelationships and their relative authority and the like that the author of this apocalypse is trying to create uh, and I and I get at that map uh, by just trying to notice what is the author drawing attention to both within and beyond lived experience as it unfolds both its map and its meta, meta story in regard to the cosmos so um, as as uh, one reads through first enoch uh, some portion of first enoch for example uh, just to uh, and none of its portions are really all that long so take the time to think all right i'm reading this as I, as I engage this, what does the author ask me to see and to imagine is out there? If I were a, a cartographer of this cosmos, what would I have to put on a map? And then, where does that locate me in this map? Or what does it mean to be here in this place where I am, if this is the map all around me? And to do this both in regard to map and to meta story uh, that is the temporal dimension the 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 third dimension of of the apocalypse um, not just the two, two dimensions of space as it were um, okay I know space has three dimensions but work with me but also the 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 dimension of where the this cosmos has come from and where it's heading uh, and then to ask the question how does this uh, map in both of its dimensions, temporal and spatial, created by this particular apocalypse, interact selectively and interpretatively with other symbolic maps available to the people it addresses. Um, in my own work, I, I think I've done uh, more in this regard in regard to um, uh, Revelation as one map of the cosmos and one meta story for the cosmos uh, over against. Um, Roman imperial ideology and its maps and its meta story uh, and, and particular uh, being interested in how John as he crafts revelation uh, basically subsumes the map and the meta story uh, told by the dominant culture out there and and rewrites both in light of the map and the meta story uh, that he uh, portrays as the um, the most fundamental, the most real, the one that must uh, most occupy the attention of his churches and and therefore serve as the basis for their um, their decisions about actions, allegiances, and and the like. So then we also ask, how does the apocalypse's map and especially its reenvisioning of facets of lived experience interpret? Uh, the realities that people could otherwise see or experience or perhaps even have experienced. So let's say in the case of Daniel, for example, uh, do we find uh, uh, places in Daniel where the lived experience of Judeans um, living between, say, 175 and 166 BC is represented? And if so, how? In what light? Um, and then looking at all of that information to ask about the, the rhetorical effect of an apocalypse. What effects does the author's evocation of particular facets of this symbolic universe, its map and meta story, have upon the affections, the motivations, and the alignments of the hearers in the midst of their lived experience? Um, that is to say, if I accept Daniel's cosmos, his map and his meta story. How do I live now in uh, mid-second century Judea amidst the tensions and challenges that I face? Um, um, how has Daniel bumped other uh, depictions of that order uh, so that I am now more likely to chart my course uh, based on his map then on the map of, say, the Jewish Hellenizers and the Hellenistic kings themselves. 
Um, and these questions can be asked of, of almost every um, author of an apocalypse, and um, always with some interpretative gain for understanding how the apocalypse is put together uh, and what, what kind of um, effect it is trying to have on its hearers and how it's achieving this.